okay so that's where we were sorry we will have to merge the videos later together so I was saying um, when uh, when we increase the focal length so what what we have done is we moved the camera back but we zoomed in to keep the size of the red bottle the same and now if that's the case you notice that at this larger focal length the relative height of these two is more closer to each other than the previous case. The blue bottle appears larger compared to the red bottle. I mean, relative to the red bo bottle, it appears larger than when it was at the low focal length, okay? And now, if I go further back and then increase the fo focal length further, this is now a 55 millimeter lens. Um, the, this blue bottle is about half the size of the red bottle. And if, in fact, if I continue to do that, if I really was able to go back to infinity and then zoomed in to make the red bottle the same size then the blue bottle was actually appeared the same size as the red bottle because really the difference between them in distance does not really matter if I'm infinitely far away they are they are roughly at the same distance if I'm infinitely far away okay so an orthographic camera can really be considered as being very far away so that there is no variation in Z. There is no variation in depth. I'm calling Z the axis going outside the camera. So there is no variation in depth and having very long focal lengths. So hence, there is no perspective distortion. And if that's the case, equal lengths in the world will appear equal size, okay? So in the canonical coordinate system, let me write the camera model for an orthographic camera, yes. If, so, so how will you take a parallel picture? You don't have a parallel projection camera with you. But, but what device will you use? No, but your normal camera, if, 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 if the camera is here and the imaging plane is like this and then the bottles are here, you'll still get perspective distortion because all the rays from the bottles will have to pass through the pinhole. So the way you can take a parallel picture is Theoretically speaking, if you move this camera infinitely far away and infinitely zoom in to those bottles. If that's the case, then they will be, so if you are actually at infinity, then they will be actually perfectly the same height. Now that might not be the case, you might be like just very far away and then they will be approximately the same height. Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, so, so the question is what about satellite imaging? So yeah. Satellite imaging is typically like that. In fact, I, I will specifically talk about satellite imaging in just a moment. Uh, when you have cameras on a satellite, uh, they are very far away, and then they are zoomed into a small portion of the uh, of the globe of the Earth. And so, yes, uh, the, you might you might think of it like that. Uh, if yes, so if the telescope is set to zoom into a very small area of a uh, far away region, then yes, the image will be approximately orthographic because to zoom into a very far area, a very small area far away, you have to have very long focal length. Okay, so I, I will talk about some practical cases in just a moment. Sorry? Uh, the short answer to that is yes, I will talk about it in just a moment. In in fact, you can draw perfect orthographic pictures. I just showed you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it will be approximately orthographic. Yeah. Because the highest point, the highest point on the Earth from sea level is about eight kilometers only. Uh, um, a, a low Earth orbit satellite is is several hundred kilometers typically. Uh, a geostationary orbit satellite, for example, we don't use geostationary orbit satellites for for imaging because they are very far away. But a geostationary orbit is like thirty six thousand kilometers, right? And and the highest point on Earth is eight kilometers. That's Mount Everest, right? So so it's like almost almost infinitely far away. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you have to increase the focal length if you want to keep the object the same size. 
no no the focal length is just uh, the focal length is just the distance from the imaging plane of the camera center so if you just move this this is inside the body of the camera right so if you just take this camera anywhere i mean this arrangement would remain the same unless you increase the focal length all right okay so what i want to do is i have described what orthographic projection is to you qualitatively i want to write a mathematical model for this okay it's like we wrote a mathematical model for the perspective camera i want to write a mathematical model for the orthographic camera and actually in the canonical coordinate system is it's quite simple because all the rays are entering parallel in the world but the relationship between x and y coordinates is small x is cap x and small y is cap y right i'm assuming z is going outside the camera so the z coordinate really doesn't matter how far away this point is wherever that point is in x and y it will map to the same location recall the windows of that that building that i showed you well where the map in the image depends on what their x and y is even if they were further away or they were closer they will actually map to the same point uh, given that this is a perfect orthographic projection okay so in the canonical coordinate system this relationship is very simple uh, that's it it's it's about as simple as it get contrast this to what was the relationship in the perspective camera small x was equal to f x over z and uh, small y was equal to f y over z so the i mean f is just a scale factor here you can you can consider that bigger or smaller the real difference is that there was a division by z involved so how f the further away the point was the smaller x and y coordinates were going to get the image coordinates were going to get but that's not happening here yes uh, uh, yeah. Okay, so I've written the orthographic image in, in the simplest form of it where, where I've not included any scale factor here, but I can if I want to. So that, that is typically called scaled orthographic projection, which means that I can have a different scale for small x and small y. I don't, I don't have to draw a picture as big as my scene, okay? But that will just be a, a 2D scaling of it. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so this is in the canonical view. So, in the canonical view, there is no issue like that. But, but it really doesn't matter. Even if, I'll, see, I'll show you. If, even if you rotate it, the rotation is applied to the world points. Like the inverse of that rotation is applied to the world points. Then we get rotated points, and then we just do canonical view. We do the same thing as what we do for a perspective camera. Okay. Okay, so uh, everything in this course, we try to write them as matrices, right? You have learned that so far. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm not going to settle for these equations unless I can write them in matrix form, okay? Uh, but they are actually pretty simple to write in matrix form. The world point is XYZ. This is a, this is a point in uh, P3, right? And, and to, to be able to get XY here, I have to have a 1 here so that X is the same as cap X, and I have to have a 1 here. So that y is the same as cap y and then i just put a one here so that one is equal to one i i still get a one here there's no scaling happening okay all right so consider that this is still a three by this is still a three by four matrix which is what we are used to for cameras and that's not a surprise because i'm mapping a p3 point to a p2 point just by that, I mean, even if I knew nothing about cameras, just by the fact that the four vector has to map to a three vector, that means the matrix has to be three by four. Okay, and that's that's the that's always true for any type of camera. All right, now the first three by three block of this, which we saw before, also as having some special properties. Now notice that that's a singular matrix which means there is a column of zeros here and there is a row of zeros here in that three by three block, which means that this cannot be inverted. The rank of this part is less than three. Now this was actually a condition in, I, I didn't, I, I mentioned this briefly, but this was actually a condition in finite cameras. If the camera is a finite perspective camera, finite camera, we call these finite projective cameras, which means the, the lens center is not at infinity which is a pinhole camera, then the first three by three block has to be non-singular. It has to be invertible. 
that's a that's a condition for a finite camera. Uh, in this case, that condition is gone because the camera center is now at infinity. Uh, this condition is gone, and it's it actually turns out that it's a singular block now, uh, which means this three by three part cannot be inverted. Okay, and the last row here is zero 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 one. This is also the reason why we sometimes term these cameras affine cameras uh, for orthographic cameras. Because remember when we were talking about affine 2D transformations, it turned out, compared to a homography, it turned out that the last row was 0, 0, 001. Now in this case, this last row is constrained. If you have an orthographic camera, the last row will always be 0, 0, 0, 001 because the Z coordinate is not going to play any role. Okay? And so this is uh, in the canonical view. The last row is always going to be 0, 0, 0, 001. And that's, uh, that's why they are also called affine cameras, by analogy to the affine transformation we discussed in P2. Okay? And now, we saw before that the camera center can be found as the null vector of this 3 by 4 matrix. Right? Now, notice that if I, if I want the null vector of this matrix, the null vector is a scale factor of 0, 0, 1, 0, because, because I can multiply a 1 with this column. So if I write 0, 0, 1, 0, the z gets multiplied with this column, and that will be still a 0. And the, 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 this, this, and this have to be a 0 to cancel out these 1s. But the middle part can be anything other than 0. The, the third element can be anything other than 0, because it will get multiplied by 0. And then I'll get all zeros as the product. Okay? So I can just observe that the null vector is 0, 0, 1, 0 without actually computing it. If you want to compute it, it will also give you the same thing, which is a point at infinity because the last element is 0, okay? which is consistent now. I, I set up this matrix just by my observation that this is how a matrix of orthographic cameras should be, but it's consistent that the camera center came, comes out to be at infinity, which is what my understanding for an orthographic camera is. All right. Is everyone okay with that? All right. So uh, in, now what will happen in general view, not, not in the canonical view? Well, in general view, I really don't have to do anything different. I, I use the same camera matrix, uh, which is, uh, we, I use the same camera matrix, which is a 3 by 4 matrix. But before things hit this matrix, I transform them by, by, uh, by a rigid body transform like I did when I developed the perspective camera model, okay? So, so this, this point in general view, oops, apologies. So this point in general view, uh, uh, the same argument that I did before, remember? I said if, if I were in the canonical view, the clock would be in front of me. Now if I take, let's say, 10 steps that way, the clock is not in front of me. I want to compute that. But to be able to compute that, what I can do is I can just remain in canonical view and move the world backward by 10 points, uh, by 10 steps, okay? So whatever that backward transformation is, is a rigid body transform and that's encoded in this. So this point will get, this point x, y, z will get transformed by this uh, in the world backwards by whatever the transformation was required to move the camera to where it is, okay? And then everything is in canonical view so I can use the same matrix. All right, so uh, nothing different here. I'm, I'm doing exactly the same step that I did with the perspective camera. Now, notice that I can write this also like this. Because, uh, because this last row was 0, 0, 0, 1, it's not doing any action really, okay? And so I'll get exactly the same x, y if I just drop this row and drop this row also. I'll get exactly the same x, y. So this is actually a point in R2 now. It's not a point in P2 because it's a two vector. Okay. I needed, I needed that P2 representation for perspective camera because there was a division involved. And I needed to encode that division as, as a matrix operation. So I used this P2 space. But here I don't need that anymore because there's not going to be, the last element is always going to be one. And so I can just drop wherever this one came from, I can just drop that because it's always one. Okay, so I can just drop this and I can just drop this and write it simply like this. All right, 
So this is now a two by three matrix, which is the which is the camera acting here. To to result in a two, this is two by three, this is three by four, and this is four by one. Okay, or I can in in matrix form I can write it as now I'm writing x tilde because it's an R two vector, so I'm writing small x tilde, and I I call this two by three matrix K orthographic K O K sub O. And then there's an R pi Tx like, like we had before. Note that also, well, the third row of R pi T also doesn't matter, right? Because what's going to happen when I multiply? I'm going to get x, well, here I'm going to get R11 times x plus R12 times y plus R13 times z plus Tx, and then r21x plus r22y plus r23z plus ty and then I am going to get something r31x plus r32y plus r33z plus tz but that but that term is going to get multiplied by zeros here when it further multiplies here so these two zeros mean that the third row is not relevant also so if I want to write this I can write this like this also uh, I'm writing the rotation part here and then then I have to add Tx and Ty. I mean, multiply this out and you'll get exactly the same equation as what you get from here. Yeah. This here? This one? Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, but so so then XYZ scale factor would be off if I drop it. So I have to keep it just to get the scale factor right. But I can always write a world point like this. I can always write it in normalized form. Notice that this equation is on both sides, it's not using any projective space. It's a purely Euclidean form of equation. And that's right because there's no division involved, so I can write it like this if I want to. Okay. This is a pure linear equation. It's uh, x, y, z multiplied by a matrix, and then there's an addition involved. OK, so uh, just to understand this model, uh, I, I've stated this in words, but just to see that mathematically, what's the relationship between an orthographic pr pr projection and a perspective projection? OK, so we consider a pinhole camera, which is very far away and zoomed into the scene. So what's the model like that? Now, because the camera is very far away, whatever is the depth of the, of the scene does not really matter. It almost appears constant depth to the camera because the camera is very, very far away. Okay, how far away does the camera have to be? Well, it really depends on how much depth there was in the scene. Uh, like in the case of Earth, we said between sea level and the highest mountain, the, the change in depth is about eight kilometer. So the camera should be like maybe 20 times that far away. And then I can assume that this depth really doesn't matter. Okay. What I mean, if you if you make a bad assumption, it's going to show up as error in your points. But I mean, the camera is far away relative to what depth you expect in the scene. Okay. So if I'm flying, let's say a drone, and there are cars that I'm observing on the road, then each car is about two meters high. So if the drone is about a hundred meter high, I would say, well, that two meter doesn't really matter to me if the camera is about 100 meter high, right? Because that's 50 times the maximum depth of the scene, okay? So, so if the depth variation in the scene is small compared to the distance of the camera, then it can be approximated by a constant value. So what will happen for the perspective model? Well, small x is cap x, f cap x over z, but this z is gonna be a constant. I'm showing that by z bar. For all points, it's gonna be the same z bar, okay? And then y is also going to be f cap y over z bar. So, so since f over z bar is now a constant, because it's, it's true for all points that it's the same z bar because z didn't really matter, so I use that average value of it. So if f over z is a constant, I can write it as m. So x is mx, y is my. And that's just scaled orthographic projection. It's orthographic projection, but just just bigger or smaller in, in, in 2D scaling. M, M now is just a scale factor in, in a 2D transformation. Okay? So that's the relationship exactly. 
if the camera is so far away that you can assume that the depth variation of the world does not matter anymore, it's much smaller than the camera, maybe, maybe at least 20 times far away or something, you can have that kind of a rule of thumb for you, then you can assume that your perspective camera is orthographic or scaled orthographic. Okay. So you have seen these, uh, uh, you have seen these photographers, let's say, in, uh, uh, in a cricket match and they have these like long lenses on, 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 on their camera. And often what they are doing is they're using a very high zoom value, which means a very long focal length to like focus just on the batsman and so on. And then the image that you get is approximately orthographic. You don't see any, any perspective distortions in that image. Okay, but if I'm, if I'm focused on the batsman, which is half a pitch away, half the distance of the ground away, right? Uh, because he's at the center. And then I have a fielder the same distance back away, let's say, at the boundary behind the batsman. Then my orthographic assumption would not work well because the difference in depth between those two points compared to where I am is actually significant. It can't be ignored. All right? Some properties of orthographic projection. We have already seen this. Parallel lines will remain parallel. This was not a property of perspective projection. In perspective projection, parallel lines in general do not remain parallel, right? Uh, there's no perspective distortion. Equal lengths in the world appear as equal lengths in the image. Uh, images of a plane taken by an orthographic camera, we, we saw this result that images of a plane taken by a perspective camera are related by a homography. It turns out that images of a plane taken by an orthographic camera are related by an affine transformation. Okay. An affine transformation also preserves parallel lines. So yeah, that's consistent in our understanding with the uh, orthographic camera. Uh, I have not done the proof here, but you can, you can try this proof. This proof is similar to the proof that, that we did for, for the perspective camera. Okay. Now you asked, where are these cameras going to be used? Okay. There are a lot of practical cases in which these cameras, uh, practical and theoretical cases where these cameras come up. And that's why it's important to talk about this camera. A camera which is actually very far away compared to the depth variation of the scene can be approximated by an orthographic camera. For example, a photograph like this. Okay. Now this photograph is taken, uh, this is Manhattan and this photograph is taken maybe by a helicopter. Okay. The camera is on a helicopter which is, which is far away from these buildings and a long zoom lens is used. Now how do I know that a long zoom lens is used because compared uh, Compared to the depth variation of the world, which is, let's say, the depth variation between this building and that building behind it, compared to that, my, my claim is that the camera is very far away. And how do I know that? Because I see this line, for example, and then this line, oops, I've, I've not drawn it properly, but these lines are approximately parallel. They, this line, these lines are approximately parallel. They, do not, they not, do not seem to be converging, even though they are at different depths in the world. No, there is a depth variation, right? So if, if I was not that far away, my claim is if I was not that far away, if I was on a nearby building and I exactly covered the same scene, I would see a distortion, a perspective distortion, a difference in height, for example, or a convergence of lines that are going in the depth direction between this building and that building because they're not, they not the same distance from the camera, okay? But now that I'm far away, their lines remain almost parallel. So I'm saying this scene can now be approximated with an orthographic camera. Does that answer your question? Okay. Uh, why would I want to con uh, approximate it with an orthographic camera even though I, I can find the camera model of a perspective camera here also? Because sometimes the mathematics, orthographic cameras are purely linear devices. So sometimes the mathematics becomes simpler in, in some problems. Okay. Orthographic projection is often used in computer games. You see scenes like these in, for example, SimCity or I don't know what's the new equivalent of SimCity. I used to play SimCity when I was in college. I, I don't know what. Do people still play that? No? No. <laughs> okay, what, what's the other thing like this that you play? All these tycoon games, for example, almost always have this type of view. And this is an orthographic projection that you use. You use this in illustrations and isometric drawings and so on. Okay, uh, these are synthetic images, not 
not real images. Uh, a, a scanner provides an orthographic image. Okay, when you put a piece of paper on on a scanner, uh, the scanner does not have this perspective projection where rays have to meet on a on a point. In fact, the scanner camera actually moves so that rays remain parallel. Okay, so a scanner is a clearly a form of a camera. It gives you an image. It's clearly a form of a camera that that provides an orthographic image of a planar object, really, most of the time. Okay. Uh, one other reason is to is to uh, to talk about orthographic cameras is that sometimes your scene is not actually orthographic, but you approximate it with an orthographic camera. Uh, and the reason to do that is sometimes some some imaging algorithms, some mathematical algorithms, become really simple, and uh, and they yield elegant solutions, elegant closed form solutions, which are not possible with with a nonlinear model of the perspective camera. Okay, we will we will inshallah look at one such algorithm, which is a very famous algorithm, the Tomasi and Kanadi structure for motion algorithm, when we talk about geometry of multiple images. Okay, uh, and there to 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 reach a solution of the three D structure of the world, it's an algorithm to estimate the three D structure of the world from images. Okay, and to reach a solution to the three D structure of the world, uh, they assume an orthographic camera, and that yields a very simple and elegant solution. It's a bit inaccurate. It's not like perfectly accurate, but but it's simple and easy to code and and very stable in its estimation. Okay, so it's kind of like a mathematical trick and a trade-off that people sometimes use. And we know now from our understanding when I can use it and when I can't use it, uh, because uh, because if the camera is too close to the depth variation of the world, then then that approximation that you do with an orthographic camera will be a poor approximation. All right. Yeah. Why is it there a matrix to convert only classic images into images? Uh, because there is a matrix for classic images. Just a matrix you can multiply by, by all the points in the perspective and convert it into a matrix. Uh, that's a that's a good question. So, so what I will have to do. Uh, if the image is of a plane, if the image is of only a plane, and you have a perspective image of a plane, then to convert it into an orthographic image means that you have to rectify that image, because that is what rectification does. It makes non-parallel lines parallel, right? I remember I showed you examples of rectification. So, so in that case, yes, you have a simple transformation that will convert your, and in fact, it's a homography, that will convert your perspective image into an orthographic image okay but the image is but if the world is non planar which means you have boxes and so on then no, then there will be no single transformation matrix that can do that because there is a rectification in this direction and then there is a rectification in this direction and then there is a rectification in this direction all are different matrices okay so i can rectify when i rectify one of them the other one will not be rectified Remember when I showed you rectification images, things which are coming out of the plane were long and distorted. They did not look there. So, so it's not possible to take a general 3D scene and just rectify it without knowing the structure of the scene. So that's why it's not a simple transformation. I need to, to be able to do that, I need to take another image of that scene with an orthographic camera, which means I need to, I need to first compute the 3D structure to be able to do that. Okay, there won't be a simple 2D to 2D transformation which can achieve that. Uh, but in case of a planar object, it can. Okay, um, does that does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, I I I have some picture in mind that I could show you for this, but uh, but I think the rectification image that I showed you suffices because when we rectified the ground plane, remember that road image that we had? We rectified the ground plane, but then the screens and the trees and the light poles were really elongated. They do not look rectified at all because they are coming out of that plane. Okay. All right. So one last thing that I want to talk about is somebody said satellite cameras. Satellite cameras are interesting. They are neither orthographic nor perspective. They are actually a hybrid. Uh, this is how most satellite cameras are constructed. Uh, satellite cameras do not have an image frame, like a, a two-dimensional image frame. 
they are actually because the satellite is in motion and and the motion is predictable it's a uh, over a short distance it's a constant velocity motion right so so what what they do in satellites is instead of putting a camera which will take like click 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 frames they actually put just a single linear sensor okay and because the satellite is moving we call this a push broom camera it's like that linear sensor it's it's like the that bar of a scanner right when you scan there is like a linear sensor that moves across the image so in a satellite camera they put just a linear sensor of whatever resolution that satellite is and then as the satellite moves they collect samples from the sensor and that creates the image okay so the motion is constant i can assume that this uh, line of motion i can assume the motion of the satellite to be of a constant speed and so i'll just get samples this way and that's that's a linear sensor yeah no uh, yeah you could say that i'm just putting these rows together to form the image so the image will be a really long uh, so if the satellite is moving this way and let's say the satellite is at a height where it covers 30 kilometers in width so what i'll get is i'll get like a strip of 30 kilometers which will be updated a long image which is in width it's 30 kilometers but otherwise it's a long image that i keep collecting as the satellite moves Uh, for what distortion? Yeah. Okay. So that's a good point. That's that's the point I wanted to make here, because satellite. So so I described that the satellite image is a push broom camera, because satellite images are 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 push broom, in the direction of motion they are orthographic, but across the direction of motion they are perspective. You are still getting this triangle geometry because the satellite is kind of like a point right so so across the direction of motion it's a perspective camera along the direction of motion it's an orthographic camera okay uh, now how much distortion you would get depends on actually the altitude of the satellite which keeps changing because it's dictated by Kepler's laws and and how uh, uh, and, and how the satellite moves around the earth it's dictated by gravity all right I I I did not uh, I did not write uh, the camera model for this here, uh, even though it's kind of like a mix. So you still get one three by four matrix, but it's kind of like a mix of the two orthographic and the perspective matrix that we got. In one direction, it's orthographic, and in the other direction, it's matrix. Uh, it's uh, it's perspective. Uh, the same push room camera concept you can use anywhere that you either the camera is in constant motion or the object that the camera is viewing is in constant motion. If that's the case, you can use a push broom camera. One, one other use case, I mean, there are many use cases for push broom cameras, but one of the ones that I uh, know we worked on it for a little while is this. Um, you have seen these uh, new scanners for uh, under vehicle inspection, right? So you go to some high security place and they make your car go over uh, some sort of setup. Um, and and what what they do is uh, I mean what the modern ones do is they have a camera looking upwards but it's kind of like a line scan push broom camera uh, maybe one or two or three covering the width of your car and the car goes over it at some constant speed and so it makes a, 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 a it concatenates all those roads and makes a image of the underside of the vehicle and if you um, uh, if you make that image, uh, the security people can view it because they are mostly concerned about whether there is some foreign object like a bomb or some uh, some some other object stuck underneath the vehicle. So that's what they want to, uh, which is what the Lums guys also do with the mirror. Uh, that's the same idea. But if you put a camera, you can you can get like uh, a view in one scan. Sorry? So even if you put a rectangular sensor, well, one thing, you don't want to put additional electronics on a satellite. The satellite is moving, uh, is, is mapping the globe fast. 
typically these satellites are put in low Earth orbit. The imaging satellites are put in low Earth orbit so they can have better resolution. Uh, and if they are in low Earth orbit, they are moving faster than the rotation of the Earth, uh, low altitude orbit, so they are moving faster than the rotation of the Earth, uh, which means a typical satellite might do like five complete passes of the globe, uh, five complete kind of circumferences of the globe uh, in a day, right? Or, or maybe more than that. Uh, so you are collecting a lot of data, right? Because you're collecting this at high resolution. So one of the advantages in electronics point of view is that you have a line scan camera, you get one line, you, you push it out into memory before you scan it next. And, and it's, since it's only one line, you can do it quickly. If you, if you put like a whole grid and you, I mean, like multiple rows here and you wanted to read all of those out, you have to do more work and still you have to, still you'll get a new image the next instance, right? So, uh, so that's why typically push boom cameras are, are used here because it's a constant motion scenario anyways. Okay. Uh, in, in under vehicle inspection, because uh, line scan, I mean, sometimes people put line scan cameras, but these uh, rectangular format cameras are cheaper and they are readily available. So people use that, but just use one line of it and just ignore the rest of the data. Uh, okay, the question is why do we get perspective along one direction? Well, the reason is the, sat the satellite is here, right? Uh, the satellite camera is here, right? At the next instance, it's going to be here, and the next instance is going to be here. So in that direction, it's just viewing parallel rays. It's kind of like a scanner in that direction, okay? But in this direction, the direction orthogonal to that, you have a point, and this this point in the world will be mapped here. I mean, let's say let's say you had an image film here, right? So let's say you had an, this was your image film. So this point will be mapped here and this point will be mapped here, which in this plane is exactly like what a perspective camera behaves. Okay, so in one direction you have a perspective camera and in another direction you have an orthographic camera. So that's a, that's a real practical case of an orthographic camera, but it's only half an orthographic camera because it's in one dimension. All right, um, any questions? So we, yeah, go ahead. No, uh, you're saying if you have two satellites, so, so what? One is like this, and where's the other one? Well, they'll only overlap for a little bit of time if they're going in orthogonal directions. <laughs> That will be a weird arrangement because they won't overlap except for like two points on the globe, right? <laughs> so that's a weird arrangement. What is what is uh, uh, practically done is uh, that uh, some of the satellites don't have one sensor; they have more than one camera, like like two push broom cameras, right? So what ha what happens is that one, let's say, is looking vertically down, and the other one is looking a little bit behind. Okay, so. So what happens is that this point on the world will be imaged when the satellite is over here, but it will be imaged again when the satellite went here because the other camera will see this. And so you get like two views of every point as the satellite is moving. And they use it to do stereo vision. They use it to compute depth. Okay. So some of the satellites have a depth sensor, I mean a visual depth sensor. You, you, they give you two images that you can use to compute depth because you're looking at an object from two viewpoints, we'll discuss that next. In fact, that's, a, that's, like, a, that's like a great uh, segue, so, um, so let's discuss that. This is module three now. We are done with module two. We are done with the geometry of cameras for a single view, okay? Uh, but what about multiple views. So first I want to talk about, I'll just introduce this topic today and we'll continue tomorrow inshallah. Uh, I want to talk about what is our motivation to, uh, to talk about multiple views, okay? And in fact, when talking about multiple views, the first thing we are gonna do is we are gonna talk about the geometry of two views, which is stereo vision, which is really what we have as humans, we have two eyes, okay? And uh, there's, a, there's a good reason, it's not accidental, right? <laughs> there's, a, there's a good advantage that we get from two eyes, okay? Uh, some of the aliens in cartoons have like only one eye and that, that's like swirly flawed. <laughs> okay. All right, so 
so to be, to be able to motivate uh, why we need two cameras or two eyes. Uh, by the way, in, in nature, it's not just that all animals have two eyes, right? We know that flies, for example, have hundreds or thousands of eyes. Uh, they, they, they have compound eyes, which are, which are unlike, unlike our eyes, right? And there are, there's a wide variety of the types of eyes that animals have. Uh, and even from an evolution point of view, uh, eyes present, uh, present sort of a challenge to evolution theory because the eye is not a structure, the human eye is not a structure which, was, uh, which is uh, useful in half its form. The lens has to work right with the retina for the image to be formed. So half an eye does not give any advantage. Uh, it doesn't give any advantage in survival of the fittest. So people have theories of how that really happened and so on. I mean, there is a lot of debate around that. Okay, uh, but but I'm saying there are many different eye, types of eyes in the in the natural world. Um, uh, but mammals have two eyes, right? Uh, I think all of them. Okay, so the motivation for studying that comes from the fact that. You saw that the, the, the camera geometry is such that we have a mapping from P3 to P2, which means there is a loss of information happening in that mapping. You, you had a 3D world, which had three independent coordinates, X, Y, Z, and now that's mapped to two coordinates, X, Y, and so the Z information in the canonical view is lost. Right? Uh, so, so the question becomes, can I compute 3D geometry from images? Can I compute the Z information or the depth information back from images? Okay. Or is there information available to compute that? Okay. And so there are many types of information that tell you something about depth. For example, shading. Okay. Now here you have an object. How does shading work? Oops. Sorry. How does... How does shading work? Here you have an object, okay? Uh, this is a constant lighting scenario. There is only one light source that has illuminated this object, but you see a difference in gray level. The difference in gray level on this object is happening because the surface of the object tilts away from the light source or towards the light source, okay? In fact, the gray color that you will get, you, you, you calculate this in graphics that it's the dot product of the surface normal and the light source direction. If the surface normal and the light source direction are aligned, you'll get the brightest pixel. If they are completely misaligned, you'll get a very dark pixel. So as this surface, there's a light source at top, so as this surface goes, uh, tilts away from the light source, it gets darker and darker, okay? So that's the physical model of how this image is created. So now you can, there are algorithms where you can look at this shading and assume that there was only one light source and assume that it's a constant material. And if that's the case, then you can say that, okay, the color variation has happened only because of the change of surface normal orientation. And therefore I can estimate that maybe through some algorithm, okay? So shading contains some information about structure, about 3D structure. Uh, here, the same thing is done for a human face. I mean, some algorithm has reconstructed this type of structure from that human face. Now, this is not a technique that works very well um, or very robustly because in this scene, there are lots of light sources and in a picture, I wouldn't know where the light sources were in the scene. I would first have to estimate those light sources. Then things can be different materials and different materials reflect differently. And so there are just too many unknowns compared to what you want to estimate here. Okay, so it's, 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 not, uh, it's not a technique that I've seen practically, I, there are lots of algorithms for it, but I've not seen them being very practical in general cases, even though in some cases they are effective if the imaging scenario is restricted, yes. Uh, no, no, it doesn't really matter if it's an infrared source or a red light or, or a blue light and so on. Uh, all the, all the, the only advantage that gives me is if I put an infrared source and then I put an infrared filter in front of my camera, I will only get those wavelengths back. So, so yeah, 
so so but if there are multiple infrared sources then I, i'm saying in general the pictures that you take this shading technique is not very useful uh, in fact just as a side um, I, I you can you can observe here that um, shape from shading is a cue that our brain responds to actually our, our brain can judge some depth information from changes in shading uh, and and people say that this is really the reason why women may wear makeup right because um, i mean when you put on makeup you put some dark things around the eyes and you put some um, shading on your cheeks and so on so what does that do uh, in human perception uh, if if something is shaded here, for example, which is darker than this, then your brain will perceive this portion, which is not shaded, to be higher, having a different geometry than, than the shaded part, okay? And so uh, what the shading on the cheek, for example, does is that it makes the cheekbones appear more prominent or higher in their 3D structure. Um, which men get fooled for? They think it's a better shaped, <laughs> better shaped face. It's just fake. It's 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 fooling your perception. Okay. Uh, the same thing for the eyes. The eyes appear uh, the eyes appear deeper because they are darker. There is shading around the eyes, so it appears like a like a cavity. So it appears in in more depth uh, than than the. And somehow people have learned that higher cheekbones or or deeper eyes is more beautiful. I don't know why it's not the case. But that derives the whole uh, makeup industry, uh, or at least a big portion of the makeup industry. Yeah. So what about beards? Do you think it's difficult? Yeah, I, I, I think beards are uh, are difficult to handle in images because they distort the surface. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, so, so it's actually difficult to judge the uh, uh, judge the surface structure from beards. I think, uh, but I'm not sure. I mean, perception works in difficult ways, and so we'll have to think about. That. Okay, I, uh, I I I I might look more beautiful with my long beard than, than with your short beard. <laughs> okay, we can delete that comment from the recording later. <laughs> okay, but I'm just trying to convince you that shading is one cue that you can look at an image and sense something about its 3D. Right, texture is another cue. Here I'm showing you a picture where you clearly see a 3D structure in this picture, even though this is actually a planar object. There is, there is no cliff here. Uh, it's just a visual, uh, it's just a visual illusion, okay? Uh, the, the, the squares are just drawn in an appropriate distortion that it looks like a cliff. And in fact, this is a famous experiment in visual perception. This cat that walks here actually stops at the corner, even though it's a, even though it's a, it's a, they have done these experiments with babies also. They make them. They make them crawl on a surface and see whether the baby stops at the at the cliff or not. The cliff is just. A, I mean, it's it's not real. It's just a visual artifact. And babies do. Babies do stop there and and hesitate to cross it. Okay. So this tells you that texture also appropriately placed texture is also a depth cue. You can interpret it as as depth in certain situations. Okay, so if this if this uh, carpet, for example, had uh, circles on it, or if it had a grid light pack pattern on this, okay, I will see that those circles are getting smaller as they go further away, and they are turning more elliptical as they go further away. On all and all of that, my brain can assume very easily that in reality these were equally shaped circles. They are just getting distorted because of the of the tilt of this plane relative to me, and so we can judge that. Okay, but there are many other cues. Focus is also sometimes a cue. When you see images like this, you know the, here the the uh, the trees in focus, and here the building behind is in focus. And so I can tell from these two images that this building and this tree are not at the same depth. So there are algorithms where people do depth from focus. Um, again, it's not a technique that works very well in general, but in certain situations it can work well. Okay, uh, motion is also a cue. If I see an object which is moving, let's say let's say I walk past a tree, and some of the branches of the tree are closer to me and some are further away from me, they will move differently in my view. Right? Things which are closer to me will move across things which are further away from me, and that can also be interpreted 
in depth. In fact, we will do some algorithms to do that, okay, uh, inshallah in the next lecture. Uh, but there are many other cues also, highlights, shadows, silhouettes, interreflection, symmetry, polarization, occlusion, I didn't, I didn't mention occlusion here. So, so if I see only half a person in my view compared to a full person in front, then I do not assume that that person actually is half a person. I just assume that that's occluded by the person in front and therefore this person must be in front of that person. Okay, so that's also a cue. Uh, but there are cues, uh, there are many other cues and we call these algorithms shape from X algorithms. One of, I'm, I'm showing this from my own research work just as an example. Here we used in this, uh, in this paper, we used the angle between lines as a depth cue, angle between line pairs. We said in the real world images of geometric objects like this building, a lot of lines meet actually at 90 degrees, but the image they are not meeting at 90 degrees. So this regularity of more lines meeting at 90 degrees than otherwise can actually be used to exploit structure, uh, to exploit structure information, okay? So there are many different ways in which you can find 3D structure from images. Either one image or more than one image, but you have to, in each of these cases, you have to make some assumption about the imaging process or about the world, which is not a generic assumption. Like in shading, you have to assume that the surface had constant material, for example, or constant lighting on it. That assumption is really necessary because in general, you have lost that information. You are trying to reconstruct it, right? You, are, you have lost that information from going from 3D to 2D in the projection. So you are trying to reconstruct it. And that reconstruction is possible only under certain assumption of the imaging process or of, of about the work, okay? So the next thing that we are gonna look at is stereo. How, given more than one image, how can I compute mathematically? How can I compute the structure of the world? Okay, this is the geometry of our two eyes. Given two eyes, how can we, how can we find depth in the world? So that's where we'll take up next time, inshallah. Any questions? All right, thank you. Um, we'll, have a, uh, we'll have a homework discussion or tutorial session at two o'clock, it's optional. If you are done with the homework, that's fine. How many people, by the way, want to come to that session so we know there is a need for that session? Okay, we'll have a session, yeah.